Vashishta's sons were provoked beyond endurance and said, Biu and Kandahar. The girls began to act, and the next morning, Trisanku woke up, a different person altogether, an untouchable, ugly form, attired in dirty clothes. His ministers and his people could not recognize him. Driven out of his kingdom, he wandered hungry and weary, almost to death, till his destiny took him to Visvamitra's ashram. The king's appearance moved the heart of the sage, who inquired, Aren't you King Trisanku? What has brought you to this plight? Whose curse? Recounting all that had happened, he fell at the sage's feet and said, I have been a good king and never swerved from the path of Dharma. I have committed no sin and wronged none. My preceptor and his sons have deserted me and cursed me, and you see me thus before you. Visvamitra took pity on the king, converted by a cor- curse into a kandala. This was Visvamitra's great w- weakness. He was impulsive and easily overpowered by emotions like anger, sympathy, and love. In sweet words he made the king happy. O king, I have heard of your righteous rule. I offer you refuge, be not afraid. I will arrange for the sacrifice which will enable you to enter heaven in your own body. And in this very candala form you shall reach heaven despite your guru's curse. Of this you may be sure. And he made arrangements t- for great and unprecedented yaga. Visvamitra directed his disciples to invite all the sages and their disciples for the proposed yaga. Afraid of saying no to what was more of or less a command, all the rishis agreed to be present. But the sons of Vashishta declined the invitation and made merry about the yaga at which the officiating priest was a once upon a time Kas Ksatriya and the Yajaman a stinking Kandala. This reply duly conveyed enraged Visvamitra, who exploded into a curse that washes the sons to die and be reborn for seven generations in a tribe given to eating dog's flesh. The sage then began the yaga. Extolling Trisankun's eminent virtues, Visvamitra sought the help of the other rishis in effecting the bodily translation of Trisanku to heaven. Well aware of the sage's mighty powers and fulminous temper, the invitees lent their support and the yaga went on. It reached the stage when the gods were invoked to descend and accept the offerings, but no god came. It was clear that Visvamitra's yaga was a failure, and the rishis who had attended the ceremony laughed within themselves at Visvamitra's discomfiture. Wild with rage, Visvamitra held a ladle of ghee over the flames and said, O oh, Trisanku, here, behold my power. I now transfer for you benefit all the merit I have earned. If my austerities have any value, they should lift you to heaven in your physical frame. I care not if the devas reject my offerings. Oh, King Trisanku, ascend! A miracle followed. To the astonishment of those assembled, Trisanku in this Kandala body rose heavenward. The world saw the power of Visvamitra's tapas. Trisanku reached Svarga. But Indra forth with uh, pushed him down, saying, Who are you, entering heaven with a candle body? You fool, that earned the curse of your preceptor, go down again. Trisanku fell from heaven head downwards, screaming, Oh, Miss Vamitra, save me. Miss Vamitra, seeing this, was beside himself with rage. Determined to teach the gods a lesson, he shouted to Trisanku, Stop there, stop there! And, to the amazement of all, Trisanku's earthward descent came to an abrupt stop, 
and he stopped in midair, shining like a star. Like a second Brahma, Viswamitra proceeded to create a new starry horizon to the south as well as a new Indra and new Devas. Alarmed at their supremacy, the Devas now came to terms and humbly entreated Viswamitra to desist. They said, Let Trisanku stay where he is at present. Let other stars of your creation shine forever, like your own fame and honor. Control your anger and be friends with us. Gratified at this uh, submission and as easily appeased as provoked, Viswamitra halted his creative process. But his stupendous activities had consumed the whole of the power that he had thus far acquired by his austerities, and he found he had to begin again. Viswamitra now proceeded westwards to Pushkara. and resumed his austerities. For years the rigorous tapas continued, but once again, as it was about to bear fruit, something happened to arouse his anger, and he lost his balance and cursed his own sons. Soon recovering himself, he firmly resolved never again to yield to anger, and resumed his tapas. After many years of of austerities, this Brahma and the Devas appeared before him and said, O oh Kausika, your tapas has borne fruit. You are no longer in the ranks of kings. You have become a real Rishi. Having thus blessed Visvamitra, Brahma returned. This was again a disappointment. He wanted to become a Brahma Rishi, and Vashish appeared, and he had only been acknowledged an ordinary Rishi. It was a recognition as future as the missiles of power which Vashishtas Brahmana had swallowed. He therefore decided to go on with his tapas, making it more severe than ever before. The devas did not like this. They sent the heavenly damsel Menaka to tempt him with her celestial beauty and allurements. She went to Pushkara, where Viswamitra was undergoing austerities and played to catch his eye with a hundred wiles of calm and grace. Viswamitra saw her and was fascinated by her beauty. His vow was broken and he spent ten years in a dream of joy, forgetful of his high resolve. Awaking at last, he looked at the trembling Menaka sorrowfully, and said he would not curse her, for it was his own folly, and not her fault, as in tempting him she was only carrying out the orders of her master. And sadly he went his way to the Himalayas to resume his broken tapas. There, for a thousand years, controlling his senses, he performed rigorous tapas. At the request of the devas, Brahma appeared before Visvamitra and spoke to him thus sweetly, I welcome you as a Maharishi, my son. Pleased with your soulful tapas, I confer on you the title and the sanctity it imports. Unmoved alike by gratification or disappointment, Visvamitra folded his hands in adoration and asked the father of the universe if the boon meant conquest over the senses. By no means, said the creator, but strive to subjugate the senses of tiger among munis. Resolved on the supreme conquest, Viswamitra entered, entered on another thousand years of even harder tapas, which threw the devas into even greater consternation. Indra called unto him the celestial damsel Ramba, and enjoined on her as a vital service to the devas, to employ all her art to bring Viswamitra under the spell of her charm, and divert him from his purpose. She was sorely afraid, but Indra assured her that she would not be left alone but be accompanied by the 
God of Love and the Spirit of Springtime would be with her for support. Unwillingly she went and as she entered the pre presence of the hermitage, the forest blossomed into vernal beauty and the south wind blew gently laden with the scent of flowers and coquillas burst into song. Love and spring were both there to assist beauty, disturbed by stirrings to which he had not long been a stranger. Visvamitra opened his eyes and saw a smiling damsel of surpassing beauty, who seemed the very soul of the spring with its flowers and fragrance and song. At this vision of soft voluptuousness, a white heat of anger surged through him, as he recognized in it another temptation, temptation thrown in his way by the envious gods. And he cursed the temptress, O Ramba, for seeking to tempt me who am striving to conquer anger and desire. Peter frozen to an image of stone for ten thousand years. But this explosion of rage made him see how far he was from the fulfillment of his purpose, and sadly he quitted the Himalayan forests and sought the solitude of the east. There he restrained his breathing, gave up all thought of the things of the world, and performed austerities so stern that smoke and flames issued from his body and enveloped the universe. Then, at the prayer of the panic-stricken gods, Brahma again appeared before him and hailed him as Brahmarish. All hail, Brahmarish, I am pleased with you, blessed be your life. Visvamitra was happy, but humbly he said, How can I be happy unless from Vashishta's lips I hear? that I am a Brahma Rishi? Vashishta smiled, remembering his fight with his father, and said to him, You have achieved the fruit of your great austerities. Indeed, you are a Brahma Rishi, my brother. There was joy all round. This was the story of the sage that arrived suddenly at Tasaratas court.